Thank you so much for that, Samuel. Some great knowledge there. And how about his accent? Seriously, I could just listen to him chat and chat. How are you doing today? I said, how's everyone doing today? That's much better. I like the energy. It's the third and final day of Massim, and um, I hope it's been a rewarding experience for everyone, as it has been for me. By show of hands, who would like to create a company to last at least 100 years? Wow. Jesus. I, I, didn't, I didn't think that I would get that response. Or at least something they can pass on to their heirs but most of you are ready to raise your hand, so thank you very much. We are gonna be looking at 10 characteristics that lead to corporate longevity. And the topic of today's keynote is how do corporations become enduring entities. A study by McKenzie found that the average lifespan of businesses in, on the S&P 500 in 1958 was 61 years. And later on, the study also found that by 2027, most of those companies on the S&P 500 would have disappeared, which is six years from now. And since there are no public company CEOs in attendance, you might be wondering, how does this affect my business? How does it relate? How does it correlate? Indulge me and allow me to explain. In the US, we have 600,000 businesses that are created on a yearly basis. And out of those 600,000 businesses, we have 31 million small businesses of which we're all part of. The, the mortality rate for small businesses in the US is in year one, it's 20%. By year five, it's 50%. And by year 10, just one decade, a third of those businesses will survive. What we're looking at over here is uh, diagram which illustrates what happened last year. Small businesses uh, failing is not a new thing as we all know. However, this is exacerbated because of what happened in 2020, so we're not gonna dwell too much in this, and we'll move right along. One of the first characteristic is founder's DNA. What is founder's DNA? I describe founder's DNA as the core ingredient which cannot be taught at any business school no matter how great that business school is. You either have it or you don't. Founders DNA encapsulates unwavering passion, vision, excellence, energy, doing things differently, seeing things differently. And examples of great vision, we all know what vision is, so I'm not gonna waste anyone's time in explaining what that is. But some great examples of vision would be 108 years ago, back in 1913, Henry Ford came up with the assembly line. And the assembly line did several things. One of the things it did was to revolutionize how systems and manufacturing was, was being done. And one of the things that it led to is it took 12 hours to manufacture a car back then. Only the rich could afford it. And what he did allowed for manufacturing of a car, which took 12 hours, half a day, that went down to one hour, 30 minutes, which basically improved productivity by 800%, which is impressive if you can do that overnight. It also accomplished the vision of allowing for anyone to be able to buy a car because that was Henry Ford's vision. If I can create something really, if I can create something on a large scale, it allows for any man and woman out there with a job to be able to afford a car. Another great vision would be Walt Disney through his love and obsession with cartoon characters as well as basically his love for cartoon characters brought us joy in the world and great magical experiences. Another company would be Google with Larry Page and Sergey Brin, whom we all know well. They said we're going to be organizing the world's information in one place. They've been doing that from day one, and they continually do that up until tomorrow. So, moonshot idea. What is a moonshot? A moonshot idea is, can be described as an idea that's so big, it revolutionizes an industry or the entire 
world. The air transportation of the Wright brothers in 1909 gave way to this, which led to air transportation, aeroplane flying from one continent, transcontinental flight, et cetera, et cetera. 80 to 90% of everyone in this room got here via flight. And that is as a result of what happened back in 1909. Another of Henry Ford's uh, moonshot was the fact that he came up with the assembly line, which led to the 800% increase in productivity. And another individual whom I admire much, and I'm, I'm sure quite a few people here admire, except perhaps the lady in white over there. Uh, she knows who she is, but I'm not going to mention her name. Uh, he's been revolutionizing a lot of things out there. And as we know, he's revolutionized electric vehicles, brainwave communication, space exploration, space transportation, and a lot more. Strategy and execution. Victor Hugo, the French novelist, said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Irrespective of how great an idea may be, without strategy and great execution behind it, that idea is basically futile. Strategy and execution is what puts you on top to be the best. And being the best, meaning Apple, we, might all, we probably all know the story. Apple was on the brink of bankruptcy. Strategy and execution from Steve Jobs was what brought Apple back from the brink of bankruptcy to the first company in the world to become the first trillion dollar company. So um, most people have grand visions. However, just a few of them possess the temperament as well as the skill to be able to execute properly. And this is where game theory comes in. Game theory in real life is just take a look at business, take a look at politics, and take a look at war. That's where you find the best of uh, game theory. So if you want to be great at business, war, or politics, play game theory well. You have to be orders of magnitude above the rest in order to be the best. Management team. Teamwork makes the dream work. Everyone here has been thanking their, their managers, their bosses, et cetera, et cetera. Without our teams, we're not as good as we should be or we, we would be. So the most successful companies in the world embody teamwork makes the dream work. And in an increasingly competitive environment, diverse executives help lead to a successful company globally. And you have to be great at attracting retaining, training, and everything else in between in order for management to work. Management works on every level. So it's not just being C-suite that your management team is going to work. You have to have great managers at the managerial level and great managers all through. Another aspect of being a 100-year corporation is some companies have repeat consumption and product utility built into them. If you're lucky enough to be Nestle or you are lucky enough to be Procter & Gamble, then this is a very sweet spot for you just because whatever it is that you create or you manufacture, you produce, is used by people on a daily basis. So if people are using, if people are buying consumables such as food, personal care, toiletries, that allows your company, that gives your company a leg up in being a very successful company that's gonna be around for a very long time. Product utility, would be items that we can't do without, and transportation business is, would be one of those. Hardware, software is another one. So if you create hardware or software which we would have to use, such as our cell phones, our mobile phones, laptops, etc., that helps a lot. Software would be all the Google applications or every other application we use every day when we travel or go wherever it is that we're going. Another favorite one is escape velocity. How do you escape velocity? Or more importantly, what is escape velocity? In physics, it's a term which is required to escape the gravity or escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. In business, I describe it as when a business can leave all its competitors behind. And if you can do that, you've done something exceptionally well because everyone else is looking at you as the industry leader. Warren Buffett said, I like economic castles, protected by unbridgeable moats. All the companies we see here have moats built around them. And if you want to be a big player, 
you need to have a mold built around yourself. You don't necessarily have to be a big player, even as a small company, as a mid-sized company. If you have molds, there are other ways of creating molds. That would allow your company to be really successful and everyone else in your category and in your revenue category wouldn't perhaps be able to match up with you. Customer experience. This cannot be this cannot be overemphasized. The way you make customers feel matters a great deal. When your customers feel good, they come back to buy from you and they have repeat purchase. Everything from purchasing to returning as well as receiving products has to be fluid. Otherwise, your customers will talk about you on social media and air your dirty laundries, which I'm sure most companies would not like that to happen. Ongoing training has to happen. Excellent product, you need to have one. If you don't, well, you probably wouldn't exist anymore. Omnichannel presence, we've heard a lot of that today over the past few days, that matters as well. Ease of execution and return policy, top-notch customer service, the sort that we are experiencing at MGM is what every company needs to have. You need not be MGM, you don't have to be in the hospitality business, but make your customers feel great and they understand that and they will come back to patronize you. Next point is innovation and disruption. This is big. The world evolves, humans evolve, nothing stays the same. Innovation is the bedrock of humanity. Since we discovered fire, a groundbreaking technology, we haven't stopped, and I'm sure we're not going to stop right now. A great example of innovation as against vis-a-vis -vis disruption will be our cell phones. In 2007, Steve Jobs came up, launched the iPhone, and he came up with something totally brand new, which allowed for all our phones to be no longer on, no longer use a button, but now we're using touch feel experiences on our phone. That was completely revolutionary because a lot of people thought, what is this he's making? Even some people in his company did not believe him. They just thought, why are we doing this? Everyone else has a touch, everyone else has a button on their phone, Blackberry, Nokia, et cetera, et cetera. Why are we doing something which is so risky and this could this has cost, cost us billions of dollars? Sometimes you have to take a huge risk in order to be the winner above all else. And as we know and as we can see today, all cell phones in the world use touch technology. You have to be innovative, otherwise technology and new business models will relegate you to a business of times past. Uber and Airbnb would be two great companies that have done that to their industry. So Uber has tr revolutionized how transportation is done around the world. No matter where you go to in the world, if you have your Uber app, you can actually use that and that helps a lot. Airbnb revolutionized the uh, hotel industry. Resting on your laurels is something you should never do irrespective of how, of how big you get. You always have to play offense in order for you to keep disrupting, otherwise you will fall victim to the next big company that is trying to eat your lunch. Diversification for longevity. I, I, please, if you'd like to ask questions, I don't want to make this uh, presentation where it's a one-sided thing. Anyone can ask questions if they'd like to, please. Okay. Uh, this might be a little boring, I know, but uh, we'll go into some M&A, of which I discussed with someone yesterday. Uh, mergers and acquisition is, is critical to the advancement of matured companies. Companies that are really matured do not take a lot of risk. So how do you become an A player and sustain your longevity if you cannot uh, run as fast and you're not as nimble as small startups. You have to buy smaller companies. Sometimes you buy them to kill them. Unfortunately, you buy them for acquihire sometimes. And you buy them for them not to compete with you. Some, some of Google's biggest um, acquisitions or some of the reason why Google is so spread out in different businesses is not because Google came up with those businesses, it's because it purchased those businesses. One of them would be YouTube, one of the biggest, biggest video streaming in the world. And DoubleClick is another one which we all use to serve ads. Everyone here in marketing knows about that. Failure of one sector doesn't necessarily mean your business will go down. Treasury management 
is, this might not be popular, but I will say it again, treasury management for future earnings matters a great deal. If you can manage this properly, that helps. There is an individual right now who's doing a great job. His name is Michael Saylor. He's the CEO of um, MicroStrategies. And he has just purchased, I think, right now over $3 billion in Bitcoin, which is over just 100,000 Bitcoins. Everyone else in corporate America is laughing at him. Some are laughing at him, and some have joined him. And I think in the next 10 years and the next 15 years, they would have wished they were able to do what Michael Saylor is now doing today. Sometimes diversification for longevity is also hedging against future competition. And that would be great. If you cannot hedge, if you cannot outshine the competition, beat them, then you have to join them. And sometimes joining them me means you have to hedge. And how do you hedge? You buy companies, you do R&D investment, you do strategic investments, and your products have to be great as well. Yes. Um, I, that, that especially is being I, my last FTE job was yeah. a company okay. who wanted to uh, expand and change its, uh, uh, go further into a business by acquiring another business. Okay. They set aside a three year transition period because nothing was transitioned. Products were developed that were not tested. Yes. Uh, culture. Um, do, uh, do you recommend those when you put together these incubator labs? Because they were mainly a brokerage company. Okay. To put services on top of it. But that it, it should have been a dream come true rather than 33 million upside down even. Um, it was like yours and mine, uh, no marriage of the cultures, no testing of the product, uh, no change management. Okay. Thank you very much for that question. A lot of M&A deals usually do not go well, unfortunately. They sound nice, they sound sexy when it's been advertised or when it's been mentioned on TV, but usually they do not go well. Microsoft has quite a few examples of those and other companies have examples. But honing on what you said, you have to do your due diligence in order to establish and identify whatever company I'm trying to acquire, how does this bring synergies to my business, and how are we able to integrate whatever their technology is and our technology in order for it to uh, boost productivity. But sometimes, and most times, M&A, as we know, they usually look at the bottom line. You mentioned EBITDA. Companies are always looking at the numbers. M&A means a lot of people would lose their jobs. No matter how sexy it sounds on television, people would lose their jobs at the end of the day. And not to, not to, to your point, not to interrupt you, but that did happen. Like, uh, almost 80% of the acquired company yeah. was uh, outsourced, <laughs> outplaced. I think it felt if you were to acquire anything to a supply chain, down yeah. the line, there were failures in training culture management, training to the new systems. Uh, the products were being developed that the market actually wanted. Yeah. Because it, it, their call to action was very clear, but I don't think it ensured downward messaging. Does that, does that make sense? It, it makes sense. A good a company that I would say did a great job in in an acquisition would be Microsoft when it purchased LinkedIn. One of the best acquisitions they ever did. Some nowadays the trend is buy the company but do not necessarily Subsume. the company into your company. Leave the management team, let them do what they're doing on their own. However, the earnings as well as the revenue, it's all combined into my balance sheet at the end of the day because, but you leave them, let them do what they do as Jeff Weiner is still doing over there. I think he's no longer the CEO actually, right? For some time, someone else is gonna come over soon. Thank you. Any other questions? Next point is sales and growth. Sales equals growth and growth equals revenue. Everyone here is selling. We may not realize it, but we are always selling. The sooner we realize, the better our jobs will become. Sales is the only thing that brings revenue in and that's what allows your company to outshine the rest of them out there. The art of selling successfully is what is the difference between the outliers and the other companies. So do a great job of selling, 
Actually, another good point I'm going to stress is we, we are selling sometimes to our family members. Sometimes we may not realize it. Our children sell to us. Someone, yes, I think it was Nate from Ohio or Des Moines. I, I can't remember. He mentioned yesterday that his children know how to uh, get him. When they come to him, he usually caves in. His children have found a, a way of selling to him or buying something or getting him to do whatever it is he doesn't want to do. So if you know how to sell, uh, which is something we're always doing, that's something which is going to help the companies go successfully well. You have to be flexible and adaptable. Kodak, unfortunately, did not realize the, comp the industry it was in and the times were changing, but they decided we'll keep doing what we're doing. You have to realize and understand the kind of company that you are running and ensure that exogenous factors which are coming externally, which could be regulation or it could be um, just new business models, could disrupt you completely. So if you understand what's going on outside as well as inside, that helps you being flexible and adaptable to trends. The reason I put IPO here is because it is the last point, because IPO is not necessarily relevant in order to, is not relevant for corporate longevity. There are companies out there who have been out for 100 years. If we go to Japan, we'll see a lot of 700, 800-year-old companies. You go to Europe, you see 500-year-old companies. Here in America, obviously, we're less than 300 years old. So we have some over 100-year-old companies as well. But as we progress onwards, we'll see how many more companies would leave to be 500 like Europe and, uh, and Asia. I think I, uh, I've got to my last point. Any other... Any other questions? When, some, when a new company puts in an incubator lab to develop products, yes. and for whatever reason, the market is not accepting of it, they don't use uh, common, I don't want to say common sense, but to, to make sure there's a need for what they're building and the product fails, what do you advise that they do? That they uh, explore another use for them or scrap it or... I, I mean, this is a real case scenario, I guess I'm thinking yeah. of. Something was developed that didn't sell, and, and I developed a strategy, a rescue plan to sell it in another way. But it was as a last resort. Okay. Those sounds like two different questions. I'll, I'll attempt. It is, it, okay. I can talk to a turnip. Okay. But let's say it's one of your clients, and they build an incubator lab, and yes. the product does not sell. Okay. It's not wanted. Usually, usually when you have an incubator lab, an incubator lab could be internally for just that company itself, or it could be an incubator whereby we bring in other small companies in order for them to create products which will advance our product as well. And we buy those companies at some point before they go, before they raise A or Series B, et cetera, et cetera. We just give them money and say, hey, we like what you're doing. And usually those companies know. It's not explicitly mentioned, but you know that you are creating a product for Verizon, for example. And if you become successful, you'll make X amount of money, and um, that'll be good. Back to your other question, your other question was um, um, if you... What hap uh, I'm sorry, yeah. it, it, do you devise they try to create a rescue plan? Is there a sellability? In this case, a manual assessment would be 750000 Yes. They developed uh, something that was a self-assessment to sure they'll pay 7500 but the results of the test were only as good as the answers given. So it could be skewed. And um, they ended up trying to give the software away, uh, which I didn't think was a great idea. So my rescue plan was to sell it to chief purchasing officers within corporations yeah. to say, listen, you said you were cyber safe in this contract here. It's not going to be my problem. It's going to be yours. Does that make sense to you? Is what do you advise? Because this was a complicated, yeah. a publicly owned company yes. absorbing a privately owned. So the privately owned really didn't understand the regulatory environment when they started putting this together. Bank and industry, insurance industry, or? Public? It was insurance and uh, risk management. Okay. Um, the big, the company doing, ac doing the acquisition should have done their due diligence in terms of ensuring that whatever it is they're purchasing from this smaller company would fit into their grand strategy and agenda. If, if it didn't go well, then they are at fault because 
we're buying something which is not going to work for us and we're spending billions of dollars doing this. What were we thinking about prior to making that decision? Why didn't we do our jobs properly? So the small company Spot is not on. at fault. Spot on. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, I'm at the uh, end of the presentation. As you can see, everything we've mentioned from the 10 points, accomplishing, managing, and sustaining all of these 10 points are not easy. If you're interested in the presentation, you can go to 100yearcorporations.com. I believe they will be putting that up on the on screen right now. And you can download the slides. I'm not sure if they're doing that. Oh. Thank you. One more thing. Please feel free to support the 100 Year Corporations. And just a shameless plug, feel free to pre-order the book. It's called 100 Year, Predicting the Next 100 Year Corporations. And as marketers, we created something specially for you. Everyone can have a bubble heads which floats. And if you go to the website, you see what I'm talking about. We're making sure everyone is uh, being involved in this today. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Samuel. Some great knowledge there. And how about his accent? Seriously, I could just listen to him chat and chat. <laughs>